Welcome to another episode. I am V, and this is the Sussex Set. Now let's start with some good stuff, positive stuff. Archie Day and celebration of Archie has been going on for the last about 30 days. And I just have to say major big ups to Tina, Michelle, and everybody who's involved in putting that on. Little Archie's birthday is coming up. I can't believe this kid is one year old. While time really does fly, I know it happened. That feels like it was in quarantine. But Archie Day has been such a wonderful effort. And so many of you guys have given to that. I've been seeing your tweets retweeting your tweets. It's just been amazing just to take this opportunity that we're all being forced to be still in and use that for something that is truly incredible to give to causes related to COVID-19 and those who are suffering the most with this crisis. And it's something positive that causes someone else to witness it and then do the same thing. So the good fortune spreads out outwardly. So just a major thank you to the Archie Day Initiative. And as far as Archie, I'm sure he has teeth now. He's probably walking. And it's just incredible, especially given the carelessness and brutality with which his mother was treated while she was carrying him. He's really kind of a miracle child. And whether we get pictures of him or not, video of him or not, that's not even important to me. Of course, it would be great. But I'm really just glad that they exist as as a family, that he exists, that he sees this year of life and that his parents who have tried so hard to protect him have actually done that. And not to put pressure on him, but to me, he represents something that is powerful and not in just Harry and Meghan's union, which let's not forget powerful forces tried very hard to dismantle. But he carries a legacy of many people, particularly his grandmothers, Diana and Doria, a descendant of royalty and of slaves. And I'm sure he'll be raised to see the world beyond his position of privilege because he's going to be privileged no matter what. Like everybody was waiting to learn what his name was. And I would argue even more so than the children of the future king and queen of England. So he represents a lot to a lot of people. I hope he doesn't feel that pressure throughout his life. However, I hope he adopts the ways in which his parents move in the world. And I have no doubts that he will. I just really, truly hope he gets to a point and stage in his life where he can truly embrace that. Of course, that's going to be how he's raised. Even just early on, his parents wanted him to see the importance of using that privilege for good and not harm. Even from their first donation made in his name by Harry and Meghan to build a swimming pool in Mozambique to the literal hundreds of thousands of donations made for charities both before and after he was born, as well as Archie Day leading up to his first birthday. So, I mean, honestly, we know who his parents are. I have no doubts about that, but there's just so much negativity in the world if you focus on it. And I just love the fact that associated with him and his life and his arrival and all of that are acts of good, acts of positivity not limited to, but including the name of Harry and Meghan's nonprofit entity called Archwell, which was named after him. So I pray that this kid has a life of purpose and that he does with his life exactly what he wants to do. God knows his parents are creating that space for him to do that. And I was just thinking, I made the Dear Baby Sussex video, and that was a full year ago. But I made it not knowing just how poorly his parents would be treated within a year's time. In hindsight, and as Archie gets older, I hope he appreciates his parents for all of his days. All of your days, Archie. They would clearly lay down their lives for this child, as any parent would. But we see firsthand just how far Harry and Meghan were willing to go to protect him and keep him in safety. And again, I think that's a testament to Archie's grandmothers, Doria and Diana. They raised their children to be free, at least Harry and Meghan, girl, to be free, forward thinking, optimistic and aware of their impact and the impact of their actions on the lives of others. And Harry and Meghan are determined to do the same with their child. So happy birthday, Archie. You have incredible parents. I hope your childhood is filled with laughter and love, of course, and seeing the world. 
and just being a happy kid, because that's what you deserve. Happy birthday, Archie. Speaking of action, kudos to the Sussexes for continuing their action-oriented plans. It shows that no matter where they are in the world, they intend to be of service to others, and that's why I adore them. We saw them with Project Angel Food in L.A. delivering meals to the people of Burbank. And it was wonderful to see the man from the charity talk about how Harry asked one of the people they delivered food to, a lady, if her neighbors were checking in on her or watching out for her. And it's something so simple, but Harry has always, whether he intends to or not, shown where his heart is. He's always worn his heart on the sleeve, right? But that's why he's so beloved. Because when people are talking about the way that you are without you having to talk about yourself and constantly doing it too, that to me is a true revelation of character. And we see this all the time with Harry and Meghan. It doesn't matter if they've met people for five minutes. They're there with the people that they're talking to. It doesn't matter who they are. And them being who they are, Harry and Meghan, People are going to ask questions about their interactions with them. And people are always so generous with their kind words of them. And I don't necessarily mean to lay it on, but really you think about any and everybody that has come into contact with Harry and Meghan in recent, even in just the last three or four years from the little girl in South Africa who wanted to be a doctor and Meghan kissed her hand to even just this man with Project Angel Food to all of the people that have known Harry for years, whether they were in the military with him or with some other patronage, to the relationships that Meghan maintained when she was running her own lifestyle brand, The Tig, to the people in Canada where she was volunteering, taking the food from set, to local food pantries or homeless shelters where people could actually use the food and the food not go to waste. People are always talking about the trail of kindness that these people leave behind, no matter where they go, because that's who they are. So, of course, it did not surprise me seeing something so simple as Harry and Meghan delivering food and then having someone talk about them after the fact, right in line with who we know them to be. It only continues to confirm who we know them to be. We also saw them Zoom Zoom with their charities, Harry with Well Child and Megan with the Ladies of the Hub Community Kitchen, as well as that young lady from SmartWorks who was about to go into an interview. Megan was coaching her basically in a mentor role and staying in touch with SmartWorks that way. We know the incredible work that she's done with SmartWorks and the incredible work that SmartWorks does as a charity. So It was really good to see that Megan is looking younger all the time and it's crazy, but that's a side note. But for real, you look good, girl. You look really good, okay? But of course, we saw them with their other projects, including Elephant, where Megan is narrating the migration of a family of elephants that can be found on Disney+. Plus. We see Harry with his Thomas the Tank and the Royal Engine episode, which can be found on Netflix. I watched it. I don't know when the last time I watched Thomas the Tank, but it was pretty good. It's really for kids, but it was cute. That's currently on Netflix and a few other projects, which they're not even getting paid for. They're demonstrating constantly that being of service can be more than showing up at some place to cut ribbons, shake hands, and unveil plaques. And during all of this, what did you notice? I'll bet you noticed that no matter what Harry and Meghan do, they make the news. And not just outlets here and there. I'm talking about outlets everywhere. And let me just touch on that for a second. People will always talk about Harry and Meghan. They're always going to be on somebody's news site, entertainment site, because they get the traffic. And hopefully people are starting to see just how crazy their critics sound. The fact that Sussex content still gets more engagement on the Internet and social media after they left the royal family, after people said that they're no longer being seen as royal, which as far as I know, we all still see them just as we saw them before. And royal played no part in that because Prince is still Prince Harry. You know what I mean? She's still a duchess girl, and they're still related to the queen. So it's like nobody ever even considered that them no longer being called royal or HRH would impact the way that the people see them and interact with their content. 
That's not changed. If anything, people are more interested in what they're doing because they are no longer senior royals. Now, I'm guilty. I look at who tweets what, especially sometimes. It's really one in particular. And if you follow me on Twitter, you probably already know who. A lot of times I just look and I read and I scroll. But sometimes I want to be knowing who posted what, right? So every once in a while, when, you know, Megan make news or Harry make news, whatever they're doing, because it's going to make news. You know, I go to Chris Ship's little tweets just to see because he had promised us that he was not going to tweet about them anymore. He even resorted to just calling him Harry and calling her Megan. He made it a point. Now, of course, he's going back to using the Duke and Duchess of Sussex because for whatever reason, I don't really know. I kind of don't really even care, but he's so petty and nasty, right? He wanted people to see them a certain way, right? Because he knows who his audience is. And so every once in a while, I'll just kind of like troll his tweets just to see what the good sis is talking about. And here's what I noticed. And I haven't been there in a while, but I noticed that when he tweets about anybody else, nobody hardly says a word under his tweets. So even for the people who have been haters, because Chris Ship is a closeted hater. He tries to make it seem like he's neutral. He's not. He's a hater because he knows who his audience is. But nobody talks, not even just Chris Ship, any of the royal reporters, any of the news sites, whether we're talking about ET, people, or whoever, when they're tweeting about other royals, when there's a story about other royals, when there's a YouTube video about other royals, it does not get the high engagement that Harry and Meghan content gets. And that includes Chris Ship. But I just thought it was funny just because, and it always makes me laugh whenever I see the tweet to Danny where he said, well, this will be the last tweet about them, actually. And then every time he tweets about them, somebody actually puts that screenshot in there and say, wait a minute, I thought you said they was a relevant girl. You wasn't going to tweet about them no more. But anyway, we see that other family members have a very long leash with the press. And it's more evidence that the press are partners with KP, Buckingham Palace, and, and Clarence House in some fashion or another. Even with the absence of Harry and Meghan, we see just how happy, like they're happy as pigs in mud, all of them, in this whole coronavirus mess. All of them. So to me, it's just evidence that they were in cahoots all along. And it just feels like more than ever, they've united against Harry and Meghan in exchange for favorable press coverage, which is what they are all getting right now. They've always gotten it. It was just easier to ignore the positive press coverage as long as Meghan and Harry were getting the negative press coverage. Now, Meghan and Harry aren't even getting any negative press coverage. They're just happy to talk about anything that they're doing, right? And then that dies down, and then you got to focus on the royals that are still there. Royals doing Skypes with other reporters. You got They're all up on Instagram, inviting you into their homes and doing the whole clapping thing, uh, looking all weird and shit. But they seem to forget that people didn't really care about what they were doing before Harry and Meghan got married. They're really not going to care now. So it's just weird that the media is trying to thrust them into people's faces as if anything has actually changed. Now, the thing about the family is the family does, in its mind, what it has to do to survive, the monarchy. And if that means throwing your blood to the wolves, in this case, the wolves of the press, the tabloids, then that's what they'll do. And that's what they did. People are not going to forget that. It might have worked back in the 19-teens and the 1920s, but here we are a whole century later, and people are not so deferential as the monarchy is used to seeing. And I don't care how they tried to smooth the Sussex departure over, saying they're valued members of the family. The world saw what was going on, and we're going to see more of it because this saga is not done. And not to mention the fact that Harry and Meghan are doing and have done something that is so bold in suing the tabloids, starting with Meghan suing the Daily Mail, something that the remainders, the leftovers, could never do. Not to the extent that Megan is doing it, and not in that fashion, knowing it will reveal so much about what went on behind the scenes that ultimately led to Harry and Megan living on the West Coast full time. 
It only makes people respect Megan and Harry more, especially Megan, though, because she was a target. It wasn't Harry. They love Harry. I say this all the time. They love Harry. They still love Harry. They're begging for Harry to come back without his wife. And they're even fantasizing about Harry somehow crawling back and saying, I made a mistake. Please let me in. They love Harry. Megan was always the primary target. But they hate Harry for putting himself between his family and his wife's critics. But about Megan, people are saying it's about time she fought back and they're cheering her on. And knowing the tabloid press holds so many secrets of that family and that Harry and Megan said, oh, well, it's not our problem. To me, that shows how done they are with the entire operation, as well as the links they'll go to to do what's right. And that's commendable. All the way to the point that whatever judgment Megan does win, if she wins for this trial against the Daily Mail, this lawsuit against the Daily Mail, she'll donate to an anti-bullying charity, knowing full well she has every right to keep every single dime. And speaking of the lawsuit, we saw in the last week news about the pretrial hearing, her lawyers and the lawyers for the Daily Mail both presented their cases to the judge. And as far as we know, both Harry and Megan phoned in to listen to the proceedings from California. And as a lot of you know, a lot of information came out before the pretrial hearings actually began about Megan and her father and everything that was going on before the actual wedding took place. And what was revealed by Megan's side was that both Harry and Megan attempted to reach out to Thomas Markle multiple times before the wedding in order to protect him, not as it was presented by the Daily Mail. Now, if you remember, originally the Daily Mail ran a story saying that Megan didn't even attempt to reach out to her dad and that she basically shunned him, shut him out of her life right before she got married. And Megan had written her father this letter, which we all saw, which Thomas basically gave to the Daily Mail. They published it, but left out key parts of the letter. And we know that the reason they left those parts out was because those parts presented Megan as a caring daughter. It presented her in a good light, which was what the Daily Mail never intended to do, ever. So what Megan's side is arguing is essentially that article, not limited to that article, but including that article, intended to smear her character, make her look like someone she's not, try to turn their readers against her, but using that letter to her father as a tool to do just that. So in her lawyer's presentation, it was revealed that not only did they attempt to reach out to Thomas Markle repeatedly, but they even sent security guys to assist him where he was and expressed that their main concern, Harry and Megan's main concern, was his health, which, of course, Thomas accused Megan of not caring about. He was very vocal about the fact that he didn't think that Megan cared about him or his health or whatever health crises he had went through. Now, if you remember, before Harry and Megan got married, Thomas was spotted staging photographs of himself, quote unquote, getting ready for his daughter's wedding, doing exercises, reading books about Britain, getting fitted for a suit which is just doing the absolute most, right? Initially, people were like, oh, look at Megan's dad. Oh, that's so cute. He's just trying to get ready for his daughter's wedding, and he's trying to learn more about the country she's going to be living in. Then it was revealed that the photographs were staged. So essentially, this man is using the run-up to his daughter's wedding to gain a profile for himself to ride her and Harry's coattails. Then, as it was my understanding, he had a heart attack which is quite serious. And from there, suddenly he was not going to the royal wedding. All during this time, he was communicating with the Daily Mail. And during this time, Harry and Meghan, especially Harry, according to some of the texts that were revealed, was basically pleading for him to cut off contact with the Daily Mail and the tabloids because they were creating a situation, using him as a pawn, which he played right into their hands, happily, in fact to help create a situation that would be good for nobody, not even him. And I would never accuse someone of lying about having a heart attack. And I'm not saying he did lie about having a heart attack. But the timing of it all was just so strange to me, even way back then. 
He was busted for posting for the paparazzi, trying to sell those photos, and then boom, heart attack. But if someone is reading that type of news about a parent, then of course it's very scary. And if it's your parent who had the heart attack, it could be like earth shattering, even if it's not a parent that you're close to. That's still your parent. But he decided not to go, which in hindsight, thank you, Thomas Markle, for not going to the wedding because I'm glad that Megan won't have to look back and see pictures of that man at her wedding. I mean, she has to see all the other folks, but at the same time, something in my spirit was like, oh man, he's really doing the most before his daughter is getting married. So I'm glad she doesn't have to look back and see him. And yeah, it's her dad, but there's no guarantee that he still wouldn't have done what he did in partnership with the Daily Mail, even had he gone to the wedding. He could still be on TV giving interviews, having walked her down the aisle. So if he's going to be Thomas Markle and do Thomas Markle and be the type of person that we know he is, then I'm glad he didn't go to the wedding because he was going to do that anyway. At least that's my opinion. But his stunts before the wedding took attention away from what is supposed to be the biggest moment in his daughter's life. And to me, that's unforgivable. And if you remember, the mail said Harry and Meghan abandoned Thomas Markle, right? That narrative is still floating out there today, when in actuality, it was Thomas who was ignoring them. Harry and Meghan texted that man repeatedly. He did not respond until her wedding day showed up. And this man called her at 4.57 in the morning. Who does that? They were trying to reach out to him for weeks before her wedding day. And then you call on her wedding day. Girl, we're not going to let you ruin this. We're not going to let you do that. And what kind of selfish prick does that anyway? Oh, Thomas Markle. So that was interesting to read that nobody, as far as I know, is surprised. But it's still another thing to see how it all went down. And it makes me feel that much more sympathy for Harry and Meghan for everything that they were going through. This woman is trying to get married. She's moving to another country. She's marrying into an institution that at that time, we knew it was serious, but we didn't know how vicious it was going to be. But we knew it had, it was very consequential. And it's like people in her life who are her blood were trying to sabotage it. In conjunction with the tabloids who we knew had it out for her since before day one. And the Daily Mail, among other tabloids, but in this case, Specifically, the Daily Mail tried to paint her as a bad daughter, which to their ignorant readers essentially set Megan up as a villain, the bad duchess, the bad daughter. It's the narrative that they're riding with today. And it's an assault on this woman's character from day one, literally the entire time she's been married into this family. It's a misinformation, disinformation campaign. That's the only thing you could call this. And now we see that the judge has tossed some parts of Megan's case out, saying that it's not, quote unquote, relevant. And I know some people were freaking out about that. But as people who know how this stuff really goes have said, her case is still strong and it's not hindered by that. It is a little disappointing, I won't lie. But I don't understand all the implications of what was thrown out. I mean, I can understand, I can read it. But I'm pretty sure her case is still intact and is strong. And if she felt like it wasn't strong enough, she wouldn't go forward with it. So if the legal experts are saying, yeah, they threw that out, but she still has a solid case, her case is still intact, then OK. That's just one of the casualties of the case, I guess. But she's still going forward with it. And that's the only thing that matters to me. But then I got to thinking about something else. And just roll with me here for a minute. What if this isn't just about the Daily Mail? and how they tried to smear her character. What if Meghan and Harry are waging this court battle as a way to expose just how trash this family is, and perhaps shed some light, whether directly or indirectly, on the fact that there was cooperation between the tabloids and the family? And I'm thinking far beyond the court case. But what happens in the court case is on the record until the end of time. I'm just wondering what kind of things could be revealed because everybody's been saying in their own little ways that there's a lot of stuff that most people just don't know about. Things that have happened behind the scenes within the family. 
So I'm wondering exactly what's going to be revealed when it's all said and done. Because, of course, everybody's trying to, everybody who has an interest in it, right, they want Megan to drop the case. They want her to somehow settle. People, even before they officially left the royal family as senior royals, were saying, oh, well, you know, it's just going to get ugly. And, you know, there's no reason for them to continue on with this. It's a losing battle. You know, the tabloids have so much power. She should just drop it. Sis is not about to drop it. So I'm just kind of wondering whether or to what extent things are going to be revealed and that everything is just really going to click into place. Of course, we know, right? We have our ideas, but it's another thing to see it laid out, right? It's another thing to just see it spelled out right there because the Daily Mail is going to do the Daily Mail. And if they got to pick between the Daily Mail and the royal family, they're going to pick the Daily Mail and let them secrets spill out if they have to, if that's what it takes for them to protect themselves. Because money talks. They don't want to lose this. And Megan is clearly not dropping it. So I'm just wondering what's all going to be laid bare for the world to see by the time this is done. And in that light, Megan has a whole new level of respect for me. She's a bad woman. She's a brave woman at that. And then that also shows you how unified she and her husband are. Because Harry can't stand the tabloids. And I know he'll never say it. I have said it before. He will never go on record and say it. But I don't believe he can stand his family. He respects his grandma. I don't really think he respects everybody else. So that bit of it is interesting. And so I'll definitely be watching this very closely. From what it looks like, Megan is not backing down. Neither should she. And I'm glad Harry and Megan are away from all of them. Because they're safer. Point blank, period. Period, sis. And I will always believe that. I always believe they're safer away from that clan. Don't give up the fight, Megan. This is another way to teach your son the importance of fighting for what's right and standing up to bullies. You know, it's millions of people out here who got your back. Continue to do the right thing. We're proud of you. Don't lose faith. Don't lose heart. Because what you're doing is bigger than you. We're all watching, and we know the Daily Mail is trash. We been knew that. But the irony is the Daily Mail has no choice but to use Harry and Meghan's name to drive traffic to their website. At least regarding the royals, Harry and Meghan have said publicly <laughs> that they intend to have zero engagement. Not a little, not minimal, but zero, which means zero engagement with four tabloids, one of them being the Daily Mail. And they are still having to plaster Harry and Meghan's face all over their web pages just to get traffic because they know the engagement with the other royals is in the toilet. Now, imagine how desperate you must be that the lifeblood of your online royal revenue is the woman who is literally suing you. And how bland are the other royals that you still have to talk about the royals who left just to get clicks? Woo-cha! The ghetto! The ghetto! The ghetto! This too much. Then here come the Cambridge stands, mad that Harry and Meghan continue to work where they are. Meanwhile, they told us they weren't going to be paying attention. If a Zoom video can overshadow your future king and queen, you should ask yourself why. Instead of looking for every Megan post to complain under, go support your faves. They need your help because they're not hitting their mark. And instead of crying about Megan, take this opportunity to teach Charles and Camilla how to clap, for example, instead of getting mad that Harry and Megan keep looking better each time you see them. I mean, Harry out here looking like a snack. We know Megan is always going to look great, but have you seen the look on Harry's face? <laughs> Like, he's aging backwards, too. Don't be mad because the California sunshine agrees with them. Don't be mad. Just keep your word and ignore them like you promised. And you know why you won't? Because if you did, you know you would be just as irrelevant as the people you champion as they have faded into obscurity where they belong. And I'm talking about your faves. Because despite their rebranding efforts after Harry and Meghan left the clan, your faves, the true royals, are as irrelevant 
as they were before Harry and Meghan became the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, if not more so than before Meghan joined the royal family. Meanwhile, Harry could fart, and Entertainment News, People Magazine, and Chris Ship will report on what it smelled like, and people will deliberately make their way to Entertainment Tonight's comment section and People Magazine's comment section and Chris Ship's comments and tweets to write, yeah, who cares? Yeah, they're so irrelevant when they're never checking for the Cambridges in these same people's comments. They sniff out Harry and Meghan news like it's crack just so they can say, yeah, who cares? I wish these people would go away. Well, maybe you should stop looking for them. And do you know what they're called? They're called Karens. They try to convince the world that they don't care about the melanated duchess and the fine prince, the prince whose friends actually like him, the one who still has his hair, the one who has a great dental hygiene routine, Prince Harry. But who these Karens are really trying to convince are themselves. See, Karens ruin everything. They try and spoil everyone's mood, and it's especially delicious for them to talk smack about a woman of color, one they deem is in a station that Karen considers too good for the melanated goddess, but just right for her. Now, Karen is crazy. She thinks that if she spreads enough hatred online, that she can get all the other Karens on board to hate what she hates and complain like she complains, and soon the whole world, in her mind, will be against who she's against. Take Auntie Paula, for example. Now, if you don't know who Auntie Paula is, Google it, find out who she is. But here's this beautiful Black British woman minding her own business, posting on her Instagram about what brings her joy. And here comes the Ku Klux Karen fixing her mouth with something to say about it. And if you've been on Twitter, then you know what Karen posted a picture of Auntie Paula, again, minding her own business in her country house with her vase and her flowers and her dog and her lawn and her hat and her books and her apples. And Karen decides to announce that this picture is the nail in the coffin of her decision to quit Instagram, that Auntie Paula somehow represents everything that is wrong with social media. Then other Karens proceeded to support Karen number one, not questioning anything, just rushing to her defense. And then they bash Auntie Paula together for doing nothing more than living her best life. And some even called her the C-word. Now, you can say what you want about Auntie Paula. I don't know her. I didn't even know she existed before Karen opened her mouth, right? I don't know her politics. I don't know her views on anything other than the fact that she seems to be lacking her life pretty well. And it's a life that she built for herself, one that she chose to share, because that's what brings her joy. She has the right to be unbothered while doing that. After all, she worked for that space, which she created for herself. But let Karen tell it, she's doing it all wrong. She should just keep her ideas, her aesthetics, all of that to herself, tuck it away out of sight, because God forbid she make Karen feel bad about herself and where she is in life. And let me stress, Paula was just out here living her Black life. But Karen's complaints show me that there is a segment of the female population that feels terrible about themselves as soon as they see a Black woman or even a half-Black woman occupying a space at a level of society or even perceived to be occupying space at the upper crust of society that makes their blood boil. In essence, Karen says, your mere presence in that place offends me. It's an affront to my very existence as Karen, and I have to let someone know how unworthy of your position I think you are. The language I decide to use in expressing this doesn't matter. I'll use whatever language I must to convince myself that you are not better than me. And that's how Karens operate. With Megan, we've seen this from the beginning until the very end and even beyond the end of her royal life. Whether calling her a deal or no deal girl or an actress, these comment creeping Karens have stalked Megan and now stories of Megan around the internet because that's how desperate they are to convey their angst to the world, to somehow tell her that she never belonged in aristocratic society, that she's not a princess, 
that she's not royal, that she's no longer a duchess, that she doesn't deserve security, or that she will bow to Kate, the spineless beacon of hope for these Karens in particular. But the truth is, Megan will always be the wife of a prince, thereby a princess, thereby a royal, by law. She is still a duchess. She deserves and will have security. And I'm highly doubtful that she will ever bow to her brother-in-law and his wife. I don't care which crown sits on their heads. Speaking of which, you must be a miserable slug to sit salivating for a day 20 or 30 years from now just to see a Black woman you hate bow or curtsy to a white woman who probably couldn't even pass a PSAT. But in Karen's mind, that curtsy represents Megan finally being in her rightful place. Well, I guess Karen's going to have to wait a little bit longer because Megan's not playing those games. Sis is too busy aging backwards and securing these bags for her charities while y'all out here aging like milk. Drink up. On another note, I hope you all are staying safe, staying encouraged, and clearing your heads in productive ways. It's okay to take a break, step back and take care of yourself and be still. I know a lot of you guys are quarantined. I'm not. I have to work. But you may be getting used to the quarantine and doing everything online or working from home if you're lucky enough to do that. But people are still sick and many are disadvantaged and families are still suffering. And most are still uncertain or scared. Most people are, even me. I worry all the time. So try not to. But sometimes you do. When your president is Donald Trump, you worry. But to people who are constantly anxious or have even just moments of intense anxiety, don't hesitate to reach out to your people if you have them. Make connections online. Reach out to me if you have to. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. So stay focused on that. This will not last forever. Just stay as safe as you possibly can. If you're able to stay home, that's a blessing, actually, if you're able to. If you're able to work from home, that's even better. So I guess we're just all having to cope with this in our own ways. So it's really up to all of us to keep each other encouraged. And so I just wanted to drop that nugget in there just to let you know that, you know, we've sort of gotten used to the quarantine and adapting to this sort of new normal, but it'll go back to what it used to be. I just hope that we keep the things that we learned in this period and to integrate those into our lives when we get back to being busy because that's important. We have to take the good that we're learning now that we're able to have and be still enough to discern and keep that with us. And so I hope that that for you, I hope that for me. Stay positive and try to carve out some time for you and just your thoughts. No social media, no Netflix, just truly be still. My mom used to say that all the time when I was a kid, just peace, be still. And I didn't get it until now. (laughs) So stillness is key. Even just a moment just to be with you and you. Above all else, though, try not to go through this completely alone. Reach out to people. Talk to people. FaceTime, text, group chat, whatever the case, because that's important. Once again, Archie Day has been such a great initiative for this past month. Major big ups to Tina and Michelle and anybody else that's involved with that. Great job. And I think it's helped a lot of people focus on the larger picture while we're all in this COVID-19, that picture being that we're all connected. And so thank you. Thank you guys for that. And that's pretty much all I have for today. Thanks, everybody, as well, especially the podcast fam. I know I haven't dropped one for y'all in a long time. I put a lot of stuff on YouTube, but, you know, podcasts, I actually haven't (laughs) dropped one in like well over a month. So especially dedicated to you guys. And if you want to catch me between episodes, like I said, just go to YouTube. I'm always putting stuff up over there, being petty as I do. And um, you can hit me up at all the places, Twitter, IG, Patreon. Love you guys. And never forget, toxic environments are not conducive to thriving. Thriving requires being surrounded by people on the same mission as you, not people infected with bitterness, envy, and resentment at the fact that you continue to win. So until next time. Peace. I'm a bad bitch, you can't kill me. Kill me.